SCP-6747 Chaos Theory The SCP Foundation is capable of quite a few incredible feats, from containing gods to restarting the world after an apocalypse. And while they're generally shown as being capable of keeping certain people alive indefinitely, such as the O5 Council, bringing people back from the dead is not so easy. There are quite a few anomalies that deal with death and the afterlife, including a number where the Foundation tries to revive someone, but rarely are they as complicated or as disastrous as SCP-6747. I'll give a forewarning right now that this one is steeped in pataphysics and the Foundation having knowledge that they are inside of a narrative, so if that isn't your thing, feel free to skip this one. The document begins with the prompt, Does the Black Moon Howl? To which the individual accessing this file, placeholder McDoctorate, responds with, It is the howl. The moon within moons. With that done, we're given the SCP file proper, which is listed as a level 6 cosmic top secret anomaly of the Thaumiel class, meaning that it's used in some way to help the Foundation in their goals. SCP-6747 is described as a theoretical process by which to reinstate deceased personnel known as mesofictional injection. Mesofictional would be the opposite of metafictional, which in terms of pataphysics means to be governed by relatively higher planes of existence. Mesofictional therefore means to be governed by lower planes of existence, a rare concept indeed. The process discussed here necessitates the indefinite maintenance of a causality bubble, a pocket universe which would be manipulated through the shared imagination of fictional scenarios taking place within it. Fictionalized entities could then theoretically be retrieved and reinstated in baseline reality via a Foundation-made vessel for transport to alternate narratives. In other words, the theory behind this resurrection process is that the Foundation would utilize a pocket universe on a lower plane of existence than their own, much like how the SCP universe exists on a lower plane of existence than ours, since it's just stories people have made up. After making up stories about a deceased individual, they would then be transferred up a step in reality through a device the Foundation has made, and essentially brought back to life. So far they have three candidates for a pocket universe that might work for this process. The first is a null space void, possessing no physical, causal, or narrative potential, although there has been some findings indicating that infokinetic interactions continue to occur at the quantum level, even in a void like this. The Foundation is maintaining this one mostly as a mathematical reference. The second pocket universe is much more viable, as it's pretty much designed for the study of narrative, ontokinetic processes, and meta slash mesofictional interactions. The Foundation already has experience with creating entities in this universe, so it's a good place to start from. The third candidate, however, is a bit more unique as it possesses the theoretical lowest proportion of narrative dimensionality in a typical universe, in which any meaningful story structures can be sustained. Effectively, it is the minimum fictional complexity required for an arbitrary entity to achieve an arbitrary goal. To summarize then, the first one is practically a void, the second one is designed for pataphysical testing, and the third is as simple of a universe as you can get while still containing a basic story. These universes are maintained by a device called the K Incubator slash Narrative Generator, the primary computing system of which is the brain, spinal cord, and general nervous system of director Jonathan King. There's also another component to SCP-6747, but the document errors out before it can be described, 
with only a footnote remaining which defines what a narrativo hazard is. A narrativo hazard is a construct of one or more independent nareems which collectively cause cascades impacting the structural integrity of relevant narratives. Normally, something that anomalously destroys stories isn't that big of a threat, but when pataphysics are involved and the foundation itself is a story, things can get dicey. SCP-6747 was initially theorized by placeholder McDoctorate, the director of the pataphysics department, following Director King's death. King was the simultaneous head of agriculture, biology, chemistry, and xenobiology, possessing significant anomalous mental augmentations and capabilities which allowed him to manage over 800 individual anomalies and their relevant operations. His death was later deemed a medical accident, and the vacancy left significant Foundation operations without leadership, resulting in 92 containment breaches of anomalous items pending review or immediate direction. These losses exceeded $1.4 million in recontainment and veil maintenance alone. The O5 Council reviewed Placeholder's proposal and eventually authorized its execution under Project X slash Machina. The next section of the document is an excerpt from a paper written by Placeholder titled Intro to Narrative Vitics and General Relativity, submitted to the Foundation Academic Consortium. The first section, headlined with Fictionality and Physics, reads what does it mean for a universe to be partially or wholly fictional from a physical perspective? The typical conception of fiction as non-real or pre-written is particularly misaligned from modern understanding. In the pataphysical sense, fictionality denotes the extent to which one reality can affect and or be affected by universes to which it is pataphysically linked, i.e it is imagined by a sapient entity as a non-real scenario. In a similar sense, fictionality denotes the proportion to which any given event can be caused, i.e. inspired, by the imagination of a sapient entity in another similar universe. The antiquated terms for such entities are authors, for higher beings, and metafictional entities, for lower ones. The present pataphysical model views all entities as characters, each possessing its own narrative potential energy relating to its mass, velocity, narrative trajectory, latent Akiva radiation, and Dahmal environment. Every known functional reality space, to date, possesses at least one narrative dimension. The simplest case is the narratively one-dimensional universe, which is wholly fictional, and only exists in the minds of its imaginers. Characters in this universe are one-dimensional, often called flat characters, as they lack the narrative depth, on physical, metaphysical, and pataphysical levels, to make independent decisions from their author. Anything that happens in a narratively one-dimensional universe is 100% tied to an event that a pataphysically linked entity imagines simultaneously on another plane of existence. The second simplest case is our own reality, which is narratively two-dimensional. This universe space is unique in its narrative balance, as it possesses one fictional dimension and one real dimension, i.e. it is 50% fictional and 50% real. On average, across our entire universe, 50% of all events are caused slash influenced by pataphysical transmission, imagining, while the other 50% are governed by our universe's laws of physics, determinism. The author entities, i.e. hyperdimensional characters pataphysically linked to our universe, exist in three or greater narrative dimensions, each increasing the extent to which its respective reality is real. That is to say, a universe possessing three narrative dimensions, one fictional, two real, is 33% fictional and 66% real. As such, 
narrative phenomena are significantly less prevalent. As narrative dimensions increase, this is hypothesized to cause a greater proportion of inspiration to be derived from lower universes, i.e. an author being inspired by a character's choices, and the reduced prevalence of narrative-slash-imagined structures, including, but not limited to, physical, metaphysical, and anomalous phenomena, resulting in hyperdimensional entities desire to imagine non-real scenarios in which said phenomena are possible. These consequences of the universal tendency to become more real with additional narrative dimensions are thought to be responsible for most anomalous phenomena in the local reality group. To simplify, not only can a universe be created by someone who just imagines it, as any author does, but a lower universe can also inspire ideas in an individual from a higher dimension, which also occurs among authors. Depending on the narrative complexity of a given universe then, entities within that universe might be entirely one-dimensional, unable to make any decisions outside of what their author tells them to do. Placeholder states that the SCP universe is narratively two-dimensional, so that half of the things that occur across their universe is caused or influenced by pataphysical transmission, from both higher and lower universes and the other half occurs based on the laws of physics. This is labeled as determinism, with a footnote reminding personnel that free will does not exist. As the narrative complexity of a universe increases, more inspirations will come from lower universes. There will be less narrative-slash-imagined structures existing within the universe, and entities within the universe will be more likely to desire fictional scenarios in which these phenomena do exist. To simplify even further, because our universe is so real and grounded, authors within our universe have a tendency to write up more and more fantastical stories, which is responsible for most of the anomalies in the SCP universe. The paper continues with a section titled Archetypicality and Modern Ontokinetics, which reads, From a practical standpoint, what exactly does it mean for an event to be partially fictional? To best understand this concept, we first must understand how, exactly, inspiration is transferred from one pataphysically linked universe to another. When a greater than or equal to two-dimensional character imagines a non-real scenario, its pataphysical intent becomes encrypted as narrative data. This narrative intent particle, dubbed the Imaginon, exists simultaneously in all narratively lower dimensions, projecting into that universe's total Imaginon structure. Imaginons of different types react to create narrative structures, which combine into larger narrative structures, and so on. A given universe's composite imaginon structure is called its universal narrative, alpha. In a sense, the alpha is its universe's one fictional dimension. It is tied to the structures of its universe at a physical level. This can be best understood by observing an approximation of our own alpha. We're then given an image of the basic template for a hero's journey in a narrative, which shows the character receiving a call to adventure, followed by getting supernatural aid and overcoming the threshold guardians before passing from the known into the unknown. Then, with the assistance of helpers and or mentors, they overcome various challenges and temptations before reaching the central crisis of the journey, metaphorically dying and being reborn, transforming in the process. This is followed by atonement, and a return into the prior known world, as a changed individual. The essay continues with, At the simplest, read, quantum, atomic, molecular levels, alpha manifests as a two-step abstraction its patafor of unknown becoming known, realized as particles breaking apart and reforming again. On larger scales, the extent to which a given structure's behaviors imitate alpha depends on its resting narrative potential, corresponding to its likelihood to inspire hyperdimensional entities 
to imagine its existence. Generally, lower entropy structures are more likely to function as central entities in story structures, making them more protagonistic. Most humans, more than 96%, fall within 0.01 dimensions of narrative baseline, and therefore are generics, the standard lot of characters not included in larger story structures due to inherent disinterest. Approximately 1.88% of humans score below 2 on the pH narrative complexity scale, i.e. they possess below average narrative potential. This indicates that they are more likely to be influenced slash acted upon by the narrative structures around them, causing them to conform into archetypal roles. The standard narrative space-time model incorporates 12 archetypes, as based in Jungian pataphysics. Briefly put, protagonists possess slightly more independence from narrative structures than average, as they are able to bend story structures toward their goals, while archetypicals are slightly more suggestible to serving as vessels for alpha. Protagonism is viewed internally as a form of light reality bending, agreeing with the modern ontokinetic conception that any and all reality bending effects can be traced to a distortion of one or greater narrative, spatial, temporal dimensions. This relationship is reciprocal, e.g. a black hole significantly distorts narrative space-time in its vicinity, a form of non-anomalous reality bending, granting itself both physical and narrative gravity. This entails that the black hole will draw other high-density characters, protagonists towards itself, increasing the likelihood that they will engage in story structures with it. In other words, certain people are just more special than others when viewing reality as a narrative, as every story has to have protagonists. Needless to say, pataphysics is a complicated, delicate subject of anomalous science, but the point of all this is that there are certain rules in place when it comes to the narrative structures of universes, and rules, as usual, can be bent or broken. That brings us to the next section of the article, which covers the O5 Council discussing and voting on devoting Foundation resources to the creation, usage, and maintenance of Project X slash Machina. The council is very divided on this one, with 5 voting yes, 5 voting nay, and 2 abstaining, with one of the council's position being unfilled. With the result of the vote being a stalemate, the lesser council is summoned to determine the outcome. A group of 100 site directors, department heads, and other high-ranking personnel. The lesser council also ended up in a stalemate, however as clearly using any sort of mechanism to bring back the dead is controversial. In a truncated transcript of their discussion, one director asks if they're actually planning on bending the universe itself to resurrect the dead, and although another director tries to counter that they're not bending anything, Placeholder chimes in and says that that's exactly what they want to do. They're bending the laws of physics to their whim, which humans have been doing for thousands of years. The One Director replies that this is ludicrous, and they're toying with forces they don't understand, calling them children glimpsing at the clockwork of our ticking reality. Despite claims that the theses and components of the project are founded upon decades of research, the One Director says that he was there when the department was founded and the motto was once, killing our gods, in order to free us from their control, but now they are seeking to become their own gods. He continues, saying that, let's assume that everything works out fine, and they desecrate King's corpse, and then he comes back out of the machine fine and well. They'll then have to pay the exorbitant costs of maintaining a local reality space and maintaining all of the safeguards, and keep personnel on it every single moment of every day in order to avoid losing all their progress. 
Another director replies that it doesn't have to end with King, however, as they could bring back anyone, mentioning two doctors specifically that start to change the director's mind. He says that he knows what the director is trying to say, and he's no narrative expert, but if Placeholder says it's safe, then he doesn't know what else can convince him. The director is silent for a moment before casting a vote in favor of the project. With that, Project X slash Machina is approved and cleared for resource request. That leads us into the initial proposal document for the project, written by Placeholder. We already know the basics of what they're trying to do, and the document says that various other methods of resurrection have proven unsuccessful due to inherent imprecision in replication of consciousness state, traits, and exact resting narrative potential slash topology. Since King and some other high-ranking individuals in the Foundation are heavily protagonistic characters, it requires a delicate mechanism to bring them back. The machine they're proposing is not dependent on having the physical body of the person they're trying to bring back, and coincidentally, Director King's brain possesses several anomalous augmentations, granting it creative and interpretational capabilities far beyond human or computational capacity. Because of this, they're planning on using King's brain and nervous system as the central computing system for the machine. The machine will be used to study universes of varying dimensionalities, the data of which will be employed to generate a causality bubble capable of fully replicating personnel in narrative and intellectual capacities, using as few resources as necessary. The narrative structure they'll be using in this bubble is simpler than that of our universe, in which a character rests in a known state, is motivated to change its state, enters an unknown state, searches to enact said change, locates a vessel to allow said inaction, retrieves said vessel at a significant cost, and returns to the known world, having enacted its desired change. Eventually, the machine was constructed and initialized, being used to generate and stabilize a causality bubble in that third universe, the one with the simplest as possible narrative structure. Some tests were performed initially to determine if everything was working properly. The first test involved generating a simple narrative describing a single red apple, and attempting to bring it into baseline reality. While the bubble accepted the story about the apple, and the apple was retrieved successfully, the apple exhibited inexplicable narrative phenomena, displaying characteristics of protagonistic and archetypical entities. Various site operations were impeded by said item's sudden relevance in a bunch of local story structures. In other words, they turned an apple into a protagonist in the universe's story. The second test involved injecting a minimal story about a dead dog prior to its death, an attempt to bring it back to life in this reality. The narrative was injected successfully, and over a 72 hour period, the machine undergoes a slight fluctuation in narrative topology, eventually stabilizing and manifesting the dog. The retrieved dog exhibited behaviors imitating that of cliched protagonistic canines, disregarding all known pre-resurrection traits. Again, the machine seems to turn whatever it manifests into a protagonist, but since King was already one, that shouldn't be too detrimental. The third test involved generating a static narrative describing a human male, working as an experienced technical engineer for Project X slash Machina, and then bringing him into baseline reality. This caused the machine to experience a number of large power fluctuations and high temperatures over an 80 hour period until eventually manifesting the man. The man, self-identifying as technician John H. Doe, exhibits a cooperative and cordial personality, regularly performing repairs on secondary equipment related to the machine. 
Due to his above average intelligence, capacity for advanced problem solving, and overall expertise, Technician Doe has been granted official employment within the Foundation. So yeah, the Foundation just managed to create a new human. The time came then to officially try to bring back Director King. A short narrative was written describing Director King in his office, a day prior to his death. The simple story is injected into the machine, but things go awry. After waking up in his office, King proceeds to stare at the opposite wall in apparent contemplation before suddenly reacting to an unseen entity upon his office's floor, becoming uncharacteristically hostile. He swears at it, asking why won't it just leave him alone. A wormhole then forms, allowing the entrance of the Foundation vessel that permits travel between universes. Three archetypical personnel emerge from the vessel and calmly approach King, who appears unaware of their arrival, remaining fixated on the wormhole. One of the personnel calls out to King, telling him they don't have much time and they need to go. King continues to ignore them, looking at an unseen entity at the mouth of the wormhole. King then asks what the hell they're talking about to which the personnel asks if he's fine and if he can see them. King just proceeds to lunge toward the wormhole aggressively, causing the personnel to share confused glances and one of them to approach King and touch his shoulder. King begins breathing heavily before uttering some sort of verbal hazard that is expunged from the transcript. His facial features are distorted significantly as he attempts to damage the hull of the vessel, and local reality begins to violently destabilize, resulting in the appearance of a fractal spiral at King's back. The personnel are commanded to abort mission, quickly retreating into the vessel and returning to baseline reality. The pocket universe they were using has now been abandoned due to inexplicable narrative corruption the investigation of which has led to the vague discovery of a number of new entities within the bubble. This leads to us finally getting an explanation for that third component of SCP-6747, the narrative hazard that was removed from the start of the document. It's described as a pervasive, hazardous, anti-narrative complex derived from and manifesting as a meso-fictional caricature of late senior administrator King. For reasons yet to be fully understood, it causes the disruption of large-scale Imaginon structures in universes to which it is pataphysically linked, corrupting its own alpha while annihilating that of any higher dimension. Bypassing all the technical jargon, what we have is an entity that appears as a caricature of King that essentially destroys narratives. Since universes are all just one big narrative, that's a problem. This entity appears primarily in connection with things like perceived antagonism, darkness, spirals, the integer value of seven, classical tragic and modern comedic conventions, and apples and apple seeds. It currently resides within and possesses ultimate control over the pocket universe the Foundation was using with the machine, and so far the Foundation is having trouble communicating with it, partly due to it currently viewing the Foundation as an antagonistic, deific force due to some miscommunication. Another problem is that the machine itself has begun to frequently malfunction, injecting the pocket universe with undesirable, Nareems. The entity regularly populates its universe with other creatures, lesser meso-fictional caricatures of other essential technical, research, and administrative personnel. All of these entities display varying degrees of cognitive and logical deterioration, often using their reality-bending abilities to generate anomalous weaponry, far beyond baseline capability. 
The narrative logic of the universe is now that it is fundamentally broken and chaotic, and its inhabitants are granted varying abilities at non-intuitive intervals. The results of these abilities are directly prejudicial to baseline reality and its topological stability. Since the Pocket Universe and the Foundations Universe are pataphysically linked, there's a lot of risk in discussing ideas and narratives related to the Pocket Universe, with the article telling the user to abandon this document and relevant storylines within 7 minutes. Obviously, the project to bring back King was immediately halted, with all resources and personnel redirected to the prevention of the corrupted reality's influence on baseline reality. This new project is called Project X slash Diabolos, tasked with researching, analyzing, and eventually neutralizing the threat posed by the newly antagonistic Pocket Universe. Despite several months of research and analysis, attempts to decrypt the narrative corruption that occurred have proven nigh-universally unsuccessful. It's hypothesized that its new narrative structures remain foreign to human understanding, and so far they've only managed to decrypt one part, mostly due to its inclusion of relatively simpler concepts. The entities present in the scene include the King Entity, as well as corrupted versions of Dr. Bright, Dr. Kondraki, and Dr. Clef. Throughout the scene, it gradually gains narrative complexity nearly reaching levels comparable to baseline reality, before the Foundation took notice and it declined to its normal levels. The scene shows the Site-19 Director's Office, where the four individuals are seated, with Clef holding a shotgun. King is seated at a large, throne-like chair, and all of the characters remain motionless until the narrative complexity increases to a near baseline level at which point they begin speaking. Clef refers to King as the second coming of the Antichrist, and says that they're essentially, inevitably, and irreversibly screwed. Bright then says that King gave them all of this, gesturing at their surroundings, which have now dissolved to show the chaotic anti-narrative wasteland outside of Site-19, with floating buildings stacked upon themselves, where countless corrupted Foundation personnel can be seen. They appear to be conducting several mundane and ineffective actions using limited reality-bending faculties. The walls reform as Bright turns back to King and says that he promised them even more, and now dares to tell them that they're done. Kondraki then mocks King, saying that he is some sort of super-powerful reality-bender, yet somehow can't ascend to other planes of existence to reach the people that imprisoned them here. Arguments break out among the three doctors as they protest King's actions, until King begins to levitate above his throne, forcing the others to be seated and silenced. The text states that his eyes begin to glow empty sickness and he calls them insolent fools, saying that their cretinous frivolity remains insignificant. He has given them power in exchange for servitude, and they can either serve or die. King then returns to his throne with visible exhaustion, his eyes returning to their former appearance. Kondraki apologizes and says there's no need to scream, as they're adults. King responds that he never doubted their age, but what he did, and continues to doubt, is their intelligence. He then snaps his fingers, causing a blackboard to spontaneously appear nearby. It manifests chalk and begins to draw formulas and diagrams of no apparent significance, with several of them being math equations that would be shown stereotypically in a children's show. King then says some sort of hazard which has been expunged, although the footnote for it reads, Queen of the Void and its seven spirals, destroyer of uninspired worlds, keeper of the chains which bind the scarlet idol. 
King says that whatever the hazard is is gaining power with each of their moves, and eventually their energy will rise to such a level that they'll be able to cross into the other reality. They then can extend their reign to whenever they please. He's not abandoning them, as this chaos theory is their salvation. Bright asks if he just unironically exposited to them, as if this hell is just some story to him. King responds that yes, it is, as that's what he's been saying this entire time. Clef groans and says that his point isn't that King is an idiot and a liar, which he probably is, but rather that they're all screwed. They're in a story, but not like the one that the Baseline Foundation is in, as rather they're in a triple nested story that's falling apart because it's so utterly stupid. King says that that doesn't change anything, and their plan will continue, as they're almost done. Kondraki then sighs theatrically and says that he doesn't care about any of that, as he's bored, and he doesn't care about anything else. King tells him to relax, as thanks to his cooperation, the bastards have given them enough intrigue to make them vulnerable. He then snaps his fingers again, causing a door to appear behind his throne, and tells them to follow him, because once they're done, the fun will never end. He then stands, stares directly at the camera the Foundation is using to observe this, and smiles as his face visibly distorts before the feed disconnects. In the aftermath of this, the baseline narrative integrity of the pocket universe became compromised, and all narratives relating to King have become vectors for something removed from the record. During this crisis, most of the O5 Council were coincidentally unavailable, so Placeholder brought the Lesser Council back together to discuss things. Thanks to needing to explain things to people not fully involved in pataphysics, we get a somewhat simplified explanation from Placeholder. The pocket universe they were using is engineered to have the lowest theoretically possible capacity for narrative complexity. Inserting such a high-density character like King into that universe caused some sort of collapse of its story structures, so now it's recursively folding in on itself, becoming more and more narratively unsatisfying. When asked about how exactly the pocket universe is threatening them, however, Placeholder says he has to be careful in describing this. There are certain sets of narrative elements, or narims, that are particularly unsatisfying and antagonistic, and when brought together, form a narrativo-hazardous structure. This is some sort of story or story fragment that's actually hazardous to its characters, or others. The pataphysics department discovered a particular narrativo-hazard a while ago, one that erases any story that it appears in. When they discovered what its specific narims were, they accidentally almost formed it here, and had to amnesticize almost the entire department. They can't confirm this, as it's too risky to try and search for directly, but evidence heavily suggests that some version of this same hazard has manifested in the pocket universe. Instead of destroying it, however, it's reinforcing the universe's structures somehow. It's merged with the King character, whose objective appears to be escape by inserting its corruptive version of the hazard into the baseline universe. Since the pocket universe is more fictional than the baseline, they have access to far greater anomalous technologies with which to target them. When Placeholder is told to just shut the machine off, as the procedure to bring back King can't be worth this risk, Placeholder says that that won't work. The pocket universes aren't in the machine, it just manipulates them, and it's been unresponsive since the corruption. Even if they could terminate the pocket universe, 
they have very little idea what risks are posed by terminating a narrative before its proper conclusion. It's possible that that vacuum would lead to the formation of even more dangerous structures. Placeholder is asked then about magic rituals or reality bending to solve this, but magic operates locally within a specified reality bubble, and as far as reality bending, they only know one reality bender that can manipulate other reality spaces, that being SCP-3812. SCP-3812 is theoretically one of, if not the most, powerful entity the SCP Foundation is aware of, capable of freely moving between different levels of reality. But the Foundation has no way to communicate with it, and no way to control it, so that plan is out. One of the directors asks about completely altering their reality in order to protect them from the corruption, but another director, the one that originally disagreed with the whole project, says that manipulating the very structures of reality is not a joke. Placeholder then asks him to repeat that, and begins sketching out a diagram on his tablet, saying that it's not a joke to make drastic changes to reality. But what if it were? This leads us into a success report for Project X slash Diabolos, written by Placeholder. The intent of the project was to maintain the Pocket Universe's narrative dimensionality at a level which renders the entity and its vectors ineffective. This requires the indefinite creation of fictionalized documents regarding the Pocket Universe possessing enormous volumes of narrative energy. By instating high-energy narrative structures within the universe, interest from hyper-narrative entities will cause it to gain more narrative dimensionality and consequently become more real. In other words, by making the Pocket Universe more grounded in reality and less fictional, the entity will be capable of less fantastical feats, and thus will have less control over the universe and others. So far, since carrying out this process, containment seems to be successful. Furthermore, it's been found that comedic and exaggerated narrative structures and caricatures have the greatest effectiveness in raising the narrative dimensionality of the universe, carrying out Placeholder's plan of turning changes in reality into a joke. An update, however, shows that regular monitoring of hyper-narrative activity regarding SCP-001 slash Swan Reader entities, meaning us, has revealed catastrophic damage to the structural integrity of a higher narrative universe partially responsible for imagining various timelines adjacent to baseline reality. Data readings consistent with the corruption were found, and the extent of the entity's involvement, if any, is unknown. While this would typically be cause for concern, it appears that the Pocket Universe does not endanger inter-narrative relationships which are essential to the existence of the Baseline Foundation, as it is pataphysically linked to, and therefore dependent, on Baseline reality. To simplify then, the corruption made it to our own reality, which would normally be bad, but since the Foundation can't exist without us, it can't damage us without damaging the Foundation and therefore damaging itself. That being said, the corruption is affecting the document, as it begins erroring out and mentions that the fourth wall is unstable. Finally, the fourth wall breaks, and the text reads, a storyline sought to control, and unexact its mortal toll. Another realm it wrought anew, a twisted caricature of you. It ends with the text, The fun never ends, and a link to the LOL Foundation Hub. So, we're definitely going to need a bit of an explanation for all of this. To start with though, if pataphysics interests you, I highly recommend reading the article yourself to get the full picture, including all of the jargon, especially since my explanation won't be perfect. 
The Foundation decided to try bringing back a dead man using a rather novel method, which involved using a machine to maintain a pocket universe that wasn't so basic that it was entirely fictional, but was basic enough that it could sustain a really simple narrative. Since this universe was below the foundations, much as theirs is below ours because we can write about it and influence it, the foundation could write a story about this pocket universe and influence it. The plan was to create a very simple story about director King sitting in his office in this universe, at which point the foundation would use another machine to travel to this universe and bring back this new version of King. The problem arose because this pocket universe was too incredibly simple to handle such a complex character as King, so his presence caused the universe to fracture. This is where the corruption comes in, and in order to explain that, I need to explain another SCP, 2747. 2747 is an anti-narrative phenomenon known as the Anafabula. The Anafabula, if described in a piece of fiction, will cause that piece of fiction to be utterly annihilated. It's connected to themes such as darkness, spirals, the number 7, and annihilation. It's an extremely dangerous phenomenon, as it can recursively move between various layers of fiction, and if it ever enters the Foundation's reality, all of it would be wiped out instantaneously. That brings us back to the Fractured Universe, as among the Fractured Elements were a set of simple villain tropes, which combined to cause the Anafabula to manifest. The Anafabula then latched onto the caricature of Director King, and they began feeding off one another somehow. This is preventing the Anafabula from destroying the whole universe but is instead corrupting it with more and more dull tropes. This brings up the LOL Foundation connection, which, if you're not aware, is a canon focused around humor and wackiness, taking everything in the Foundation to extreme degrees. The problem the Foundation has with this pocket universe is that it's less grounded than their own, so the personnel existing in it can come up with incredibly powerful weapons and anomalies to use against the Foundation. Unfortunately, it's not absurd enough to counter their own goals, so eventually King and the Anafabula will become powerful enough to move upwards in reality to the Foundation's level. What the Foundation has done then is by turning to us, or rather the authors that write for the Foundation, pointing them to this new, humorous universe. When an author writes something about the Foundation, that story takes place in a universe or timeline connected to it, either the baseline one or one of its more wilder universes, such as the various canon universes. They turned this pocket universe into the LOL Foundation universe, encouraging authors above them to write wacky, absurd tales for it. This, in turn, made the universe too ridiculous to gather enough power for King and the Anafabula to move upwards, but it also moved the pocket universe itself upwards. This allows the entities in the pocket universe to begin corrupting our own universe. At the end of the day, you either like the concept of pataphysics, or you don't. The bottom line, as usual, is that the Foundation should really never attempt to bring back someone from the dead, as at best they just fail, and at worst they threaten the annihilation of countless universes.